Hello and welcome to the Open Fogs Out of the Fog series. I'm Lynn Canavan, the Executive Director for Open Fog, and today I'm really delighted to introduce to you the Open Fog Reference Architecture. Um, we have a short Q&A, five questions, with the two work, working group uh, co-chairs of the Open Fog Consortium. So it's my huge pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mr. Chuck Byers, who is the principal engineer for Cisco Systems and moreover is the um, Architect Framework Working Group co-chair, and Rob Swanson, who is the other co-chair for the Architecture Framework Work Group uh, and a principal engineer with Intel. So um, we're going to tell you in five questions about the reference architecture, and we invite you to download the document from our website, which is um, openfogconsortium.org slash RA. So let's get started. Rob, um, what, can you tell us a little bit about the Open Fog Reference Architecture? What is it? Sure, Lynn, yeah. One of the things we've been doing with Open Fog is we really are trying to build upon a, a reference architecture that addresses all of the various stakeholders in the value chain. And, and when we say that uh, with fog computing, we're really talking about a certain type and theme of computing, but in many architectures, they ignore different aspects meaning they, they don't focus heavily on the silicon, they don't focus on the platform, the OEMs and ODMs who, who put the silicon in the platform, and, and they sometimes only focus at the software and there's a combination thereof. With the Open Fog Reference Architecture, what we're trying to do is, is establish that first reference point where we address all of the people and, and, and engineers and, and businesses that fulfill that, that mission or, or the overall scenario that we're trying to address. Uh, and, and you're going to see this is even more important once we make that transition from our 4G systems to 5G. That's going to be a big in incremental step in technology, meaning because you can start isolating bands of, of, uh, of communication. So that should also expand upon the overall data problem that we're seeing. Uh, one of the other important things to note is there's a bunch of different things, uh, a bunch of different uh, research areas in fog computing. Uh, be it uh, micro data center, be it edge computing, uh, you, you see this in the in the market today. What we also see is there's no common vocabulary or common language or definition by what FOG is. And to try to arrange and, and align all of these various disparate efforts into a singular purpose is really what we're trying to do with this open FOG reference architecture and really align the masses. Uh, Chuck, do you have anything else you'd like to say? I think that's got it nicely handled. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Um, guys, quick question. What is this document not? I mean, just to set expectations for those who will be uh, downloading it and reviewing it. Well, it's certainly not a rigorous standards document. You won't find a lot of numbered language with words like should and shall and may in it. It's really much higher level than that. It's a guidepost for the industry to use architecturally. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, so, Chuck, why don't you tell us a little bit about the um, – why don't you tell us what's in the architecture then? So we know what, what it's not, but what is, is actually in it? Reference architecture is around 160 pages of medium to high-level view of how fog computing should work. And it has many different perspectives in, both from the perspective of the FOG node, the individual hardware and software element that makes up FOG, as well as large networks of those nodes arranged in hierarchies. This is all put into a unified framework, so we are able to describe exactly how various elements of FOG computing networks interact and how management systems, orchestration systems, fault tolerance is supposed to work in order to tie them all together into a system that's capable of supporting all the different services and use cases that FOG is capable of. Future versions of this document, as well as future linked documents, are going to provide much lower level details, including those formal requirements that you might need in order to build and test full FOG architectures. It doesn't mean that you can't get started on your FOG designs immediately. The reference architecture is a wealth of information that's going to describe high-level designs of all of your FOG network nodes and equipment. We also have a fairly rigorous description of five high-level pillars of the open FOG reference architecture. These are basic uh, attributes. They're basically like the 
the, the fundamental design principles that should be embodied in all FOG architectures and FOG nodes. And we'll go through those in fairly solid detail in a few minutes. To illustrate and to bring these concepts down to a more concrete level, we've also included a number of reference use cases in the reference architecture. So these use cases cover things like smart cities and buildings, smart transportation networks. We've got an extensive study of visual security in airports, how to run cameras and so forth. And all of these use cases exemplify the need for fog computing as opposed to just a cloud or edge architecture and how those fog computing elements should be designed and how the overall architecture of the system should be put together. We also uh, have a really detailed analysis of the various layers of the architecture. And this shows us what the individual functions of the various FOG capabilities are and the interfaces between those functions. That's described in the RA in fairly rigorous detail. Finally, there's a set of recommendations that help us understand how FOG computing ought to be implemented and uh, really helpful to the users. There's an appendix as well that uh, a subset of the listeners will be very interested in, and that's uh, a little extra detail on perhaps the most difficult aspect of IoT and fog computing, namely how to keep these large complex networks secure. So we have around a 30-page appendix specifically detailing our security plan for fog. I think you'll find that very useful. And finally, there's a great glossary, not just about FOG, but really about all things IoT. That's great, Chuck. And I do want to give a shout out to all of the members of the Open FOG Consortium because we do have 55 plus members, member organizations representing hundreds of really qualified, high, highly qualified visionaries in FOG computing. And uh, so the document really represents a very um, nice collective branch of work. So I wanted to thank both of you for your leadership in that and also to give a shout out to all the those who, who worked on it. Um, hey, Rob, let's talk a little bit about why in Open, you know, we, we, we're the Open FOG Consortium, so Open is very important to us, but why is an open approach important? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think open is, is honestly one of the most important aspects of an architecture. Uh, if, if you have a, a, a vertical-based uh, solution, meaning a, a single vendor owns everything, you, you really aren't able to, to get competition which drives innovation, which drives uh, cost reduction or, or affordability of, of technology. And so when you take an open approach, you're not just looking at, at uh, the hardware or the software, but you're looking at the full system. And one of the things I've, I've started to see in my time in technology is, is end users are now starting to see this as well. They want this choosality and, so that they don't get that proprietary vendor lock-in. So when we say a, an open architecture, we really do mean open. We mean open all the way down to the systems to the software and, and make sure that that other people can play so we have component level interoperability. The only way you can do that is with a, a truly open approach. Um, one of the things that we're also looking to do that you'll see as the next steps, and we'll talk about it later in this call, is you know this open approach will go to more open implementations with some of our testbed programs and then also uh, some additional uh, software efforts in, in our research focus, which is, a, I think, a key aspect of our consortium is really, you know, we, we haven't solved everything in the world, mm -hmm. but in order to help that innovation path, uh, the universities are really there to help us with open source implementations. Uh, we're, we're Chuck, myself, and, and others in the consortium and the technical leadership and, and the various members, you know, we see some areas that, that need some additional research and thought, the best way to do that is through open publication, open research, which will then go to open implementations for the architecture. Chuck, anything to add? I agree with that. Openness can really help the network um, and the ecosystem of suppliers hit the point where we're in stride, high volume, high quality, high competitive nature, giving us really good time to market, really good feature richness in all things FOG. So, so we think that openness is, 
is really helpful in that respect. It also tends to be very useful to our academic partners. There's around a dozen of those open fog consortium memberships that are universities and academic institutions. They love working on open stuff because it, it gives their students and faculty lots of things to imagine. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, so let's get right into the meat of it. So um, Chuck, you referenced the eight pillars before. Why don't we uh, just walk us through um, what they are? Certainly, this is one of the more famous graphics that you'll see time and time again as open fog people make presentations. And it represents the eight pillars of open fog. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at the glyph on the top. That's the symbol for open fog and we often use that on architectural and network block diagrams for the fog nodes that make up a fog network. Uh, and and a, fog, a fog node is going to have several capabilities storage, networking, computation, control, and various kinds of accelerators. Those are, those are the, the hardware and software elements that make up fog computing and they're embodied in the open fog architecture and the fog nodes. And each of those characteristics is drawing upon this set of pillars that you see across the bottom. These are sort of holding up the architecture in a way. And uh, each of these pillars is described in the reference architecture. Two or three pages is generally given to each one and described with enough detail so that you can see how these particular attributes of networks are implemented in the FOG vision. I'm not going to go into great details, but let me just say a word or two about each of them. Security is vital in order to make systems uh, trustworthy, and we do that with attestation, privacy, cryptographic techniques, and so on. Scalability is really important, especially in the Internet of Things world where there might be 50 billion things to connect to IoT networks and the fog. Um, and, and scalability is really helping us make sure that we can control, manage, configure, orchestrate all of the capabilities. We're also really interested in scalable performance in order to get the right amount of capability, the right amount of performance, the, the right amount of latency reduction in place. We just talked through openness. I won't say much more about that. Fog nodes need to be autonomous. That means that a fog network needs to basically wake up and manage its cognitive capabilities by itself. RAS is an acronym for uh, reliability, availability, and serviceability. It's really about the things that fog does to keep itself reliable and trustworthy. Agility basically means that a, a single fog network can be retasked to do lots of different things. And that's really helpful in this quest to turn data into information, knowledge, and wisdom. We need to have lots of agility so that the FOG network can go up and down that hierarchy. We can locate analytics in different places. We can locate control intelligence and storage in different places. FOG is a fully hierarchical design. This is one of the things that differentiates it from some of the more edge computing oriented proposals that some of you may be familiar with. FOG can be a very deep hierarchy of layers, maybe six or eight levels deep in some IoT applications. So if we're doing, for example, a smart city, we might have uh, FOG nodes in the region, FOG nodes in the neighborhood, FOG nodes in the street level fog nodes and individual buildings. And all the fog nodes up and down that hierarchy talk upwards towards the cloud, downwards to the IoT things through that hierarchy. We can also distribute computation and other, com and other sorts of capabilities across horizontally on those layers of the hierarchy. That's one of the things that supports our scalability pillar. Finally, software is eating the world and FOG is a fully programmable architecture. So we want programmable hardware, programmable software. We need to virtualize and support multi-tenant operation. Basically, everything that you could possibly imagine doing with uh, software and programmable hardware capabilities, we want to make sure that FOG directly supports. All this stuff is going to be very interesting to the, the different components of the FOG supply chain. These are the, the folks that are providing the various sub-assemblies and components, including uh, component manufacturers like silicon vendors or the makers of chassis or disk drives. System vendors, uh, uh, Cisco would be an example of one of those. 
uh, software providers who are basically doing the, the core infrastructure software that makes the fog node tick. And then finally, we hope a very large application of fog-enabled application developers who are putting together the actual freight paying applications that end users of fog networks care about. Okay, a lot to digest in this, and again, as you said, the document is 160 pages, and they're all uh, well explained. So, anyways, let's uh, let's move on to the let let us move on to the next slide, and um, here's another <laughs> another uh, lots of, of information on the slide. And um, Rob, do you want to walk us through this? Yeah, absolutely. This is one of my favorite pictures, and mostly because people say, huh? And let me explain when I say, huh, what it really means. When you take an architecture, it's really important that you try to have a pictorial representation of that architecture so you can explain it. Uh, some of the questions that I've seen and, and had in the past is when we look at this architectural diagram or architecture description, you know, what, what about the pillars? How do they fit? And, and really, when, when we spent a lot of time looking at the various use cases and, and then drove down through some of the architecture in our, in our implementation spaces. We actually saw that represented throughout this, this, this picture. So when you take the eight pillars previously, they can be overlaid logically onto what you see here. The other important aspect of this architectural description is that it's a composite uh, uh, description. What I mean there is, is when you look at the, the main players to facilitate any end user deployment, uh, you're talking, you know, silicon manufacturers, system manufacturers, OEMs and ODMs, or, or uh, software vendors, your, your system integrators, uh, and then pure software uh, ISVs, it's really important that, 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 that the, the description here fits them. And so what we've done from a composite perspective is we actually have called out what's required for the silicon vendors, the SOC manufacturers, what's required for those OEMs, ODMs, and also the software application folks. The other thing is when you see the, the, the perspective of these cross-cutting concerns, those are security, that's manageability, that's analytics with control, and that's deterministic latency, and, and, and that's really a performance and scale. So we try to capture that on one slide or one actual architectural diagram to kind of put everything there, and then each one speaks to a different audience. Uh, Chuck, is there anything you'd like to add there? Thank you. Said it very nicely. Thanks, Rob. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's. Um, so I'm looking at this, and and it, it looks um, very detailed and, and highly technical. So let's talk about who might want to use this document and how it should be used, especially if you're not a technical a member of the technical commu um, community. So Chuck, do you you know why don't you walk us through who you would anticipate using this document and how it's going to be used? We had three sets of readers in mind when we were working on the reference architecture: a uh, business community, technical community, and uh, the academic research community. And, and each of them uh, hopefully will find something that they can resonate with as they go through the reference architecture document. Uh, we think that the business community will really find this valuable in understanding the, the scope of the industry, the potential of the ecosystem. They can understand what fog computing is, how it relates to the cloud, how it relates to edge, how it relates to all of the things in the Internet of Things vision. And, and uh, we think that those insights are really going to be valuable as you start placing your bets on what you're going to invest in, what products you're going to offer, what your future roadmaps might want to look like. Uh, certainly, uh, people that work in analysts uh, kind of modes might be very interested in this in order to help understand where the financial benefits of FOG might lie and where the particular ecosystem might uh, strengthen certain players and certain companies. We also believe that uh, we'll be an excellent catalyst for use cases of fog computing. So the reference architecture would be a great place to start thinking if you were wondering, for example, how fog might apply to agriculture, healthcare, education, oil and gas, those kinds of vertical marketplaces. I think that uh, if you're representing those marketplaces, You'd love to be able to come in and uh, read some of the concepts, use the existing use cases that are already described in detail in the Open Fog Reference Architecture as a, a springboard to understand how your particular use cases 
might benefit from fog. The technical community is really going to be interested in the technology of FOG, what it means to build a FOG node, what it means to network FOG nodes in a hierarchy, how they relate to the cloud, how they relate to the things, and, and so on. How uh, modular a FOG implementation might be is an important characteristic that's greatly described in the architectural reference diagram, the, ar the reference architecture. So for example, we talk about how storage and computation and acceleration and, and network processing are all interrelated and how they can be applied and scaled up and down and in and out. We also want to make sure that uh, we're, we're looking at the compliance as another characteristic that the technical community is going to be highly interested in. So what does it mean to build an open FOG compliant architecture? We have a description in the reference architecture about how the test beds are going to be set up, and that will eventually lead to fully certified open fog designs, kind of a good housekeeping seal of approval that could be applied to your fog nodes and software. We also think that the technical community will be very interested in gaining insights into fog techniques. So there's lots of talk about, for example, how the hierarchy of FOG nodes interacts with each other, what those interfaces between FOG nodes might, might look like. There's a, a great appendix about security and security professionals uh, that will be required reading for them. Finally, let's talk a little bit about the researchers and the, uh, the academics and the students who might be interested in reading this reference architecture document. It's really a blueprint for understanding deployment. It'll tell you what the market cares the most about, and that can help guide the direction of your research. We have a lot of description uh, in, in Chapter 8, as I recall, about some of the challenges and, and uh, remaining things to be done in terms of the open fog and fog ecosystem. And we think researchers love a challenge, and they should find that section particularly interesting. Uh, finally, I think that, that, that academia sometimes struggles to keep pace with the rapid rate of progress that's happening in the commercial sector, and the, this is a really good snapshot of what a bunch of very smart people from very advanced companies have decided would be put in place. The academic researchers were certainly at the table as well putting this together, and, and hopefully this will be functioning as a, as a nice reference for everybody across a much broader version of academia to understand what's happening in FOG and why the open FOG architecture is the best one for me to put in my lab or for me to put my graduate students to work coding on. Anything to add to that, Rob? Yeah, there's a couple things. Uh, thanks, Chuck. One of the things that I think is really important, uh, and this is lost in a lot of our discussions that we've had, uh, we generally see a lot of there's a thing to cloud model, and, and so what I've seen in the industry, and we've talked about this, is that that most of our areas of research have been focused in that space. They assume uh, a consolidated singular location of technology, and, and that has some benefits. But the reality is, when you do fog, you have a more distributed at the end user, or in the field, or in environmental conditions, or or the security models change because the devices are are within. Uh, physical possession, right? You can't assume that it's locked behind a, a cage. That drives a different type of thinking, and it and that's important for the business community to understand that if, if these things were designed maybe for some data center off in the, 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 the world or, or designed to be in behind a locked door, these, these might be in a lamppost. So you gotta think, well, what is my new model? It, should I have a different thought paradigm? So that really, to me, speaks to the business community and the technical community. Uh, the other aspect that I'd like to put out is, is with the researchers. When we start changing thought paradigms around computing, it's important that we, we, we work with academic, academia and we say, we really need you to focus research on these areas and, and we believe there's good internship opportunities and, and new technical frontiers we have to push through uh, to really see the fulfillment of this new uh, computational model. So I'm really excited and I think that's how this document is really 
is going to be used is to say, hey, this is where it's going. The, there are some really important com computational areas and, and scenarios we have to address, and and it really takes all of these folks to understand that 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 this is a new the new model for some very specific areas of uh, of technology. I think that's terrific. And uh, for those of you, uh, for those uh, listening who are not involved in Open Fog directly, that um, it, you know, industry university engagement is so critical to the problems. You know, as as both Chuck and Rob, uh, you know, discussed. You know, having researchers really take these very complex, um, you know, issues and just you know go to town with them and and collaborate with industry is really uh, helping us to generate uh, these document, this document, and future documents, um, and a lot of progress through that. Um, but one of the things that just came up was, you know, in particular the business application for this. So, you know, ultimately, you know, where does this all go? So let's talk about some of the relevant use cases. So, um, uh, Chuck, let's start with you. Let's, Great, why don't thanks. you pick a, a, one of your favorite use cases and tell us a little bit about it. Well, there's a lot of different use cases. We just happened to choose three representative ones here. Uh, but there's lots of use cases in, for example, smart grids and manufacturing and retail and hospitality healthcare, agriculture, government, and military applications. The three that we chose here to talk about in a little more detail are really the ones that are particularly illustrative of the need for fog. So the first one I'll talk about is, is a smart transportation use case, in particular taking a look at trying to ease traffic congestion. So uh, we have a problem, $160 billion cost uh, in the United States uh, for sitting in traffic jams. And maybe one of the reasons for that is cars aren't quite smart enough and they're not talking to highways that are quite smart enough. So uh, the solution might be to take fog technology, build some mobile fog nodes in cars so each individual car is situationally aware, build roadside fog nodes so that those cars are able to convey their situational awareness to the infrastructure, and then build uh, neighborhood and regional fog nodes so that the, the whole organism of the entire traffic system can be much smarter and, and interact, reroute traffic, uh, try to use all resources the most efficiently. Uh, certainly in transportation there's a lot of other use cases. We've done quite a bit of study on ground support infrastructure for drones, especially drones running at very high scale when we have thousands of them running in the skies simultaneously doing deliveries. We think that it's applicable to buses, uh, maritime applications, uh, railroads, uh, positive train control standards are a, a great use case for fog. So uh, transportation is, is a place where we really can benefit from the low latency, the high availability, the reduce, reduction in network traffic that fog can offer. All of those attributes are really important in transportation as illustrated by use case one. Rob, you want to take a look at number two? Yeah, and, and I'm actually going to up-level a little bit because uh, when, when we did it, we've done a lot of work in, 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 the, in the consortium and our teams of really looking about these use cases and some of the common themes that we have. And, and we've been preaching this, you know, thing to cloud model, this sensor to cloud and shove everything to the cloud and put it there. And, and it's really important to note that, that that doesn't work, and that minimization of what we call backhaul is really important. And in a lot of these scenarios that that are shown here, these use cases, you may have geographical, uh, just you know, where things are just spread out geographically, and, and you only have a, 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 a cell connection. The cost of that cell data, up if it's few not data, is 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 expensive. It's prohibitively expensive, and that's what we hear from our customers. Uh, even if you have a great coverage, but you have a ton of data, it's shoved into the cloud, it doesn't work. So you really have to start processing that. And that's, you know, Chuck referenced that earlier about DIKW model. So really one of the themes that we see for fog computing is really that minimization of sending everything to the cloud, which we term minimization of backhaul. The other thing that most of these scenarios and these use cases talk about, really a reliability of operation. What happens if a chunk of my infrastructure that's, that's designed to, to build and deploy a given use case goes out? How do we reliably uh, complete the mission or complete that, that use case? Uh, and FOG really helps us do that. So that's the reliability of operations, another common theme that we see here. And then I think one of the most important ones, really if you think about traffic congestions or, or video surveillance or buildings or, or really any of the ones we've looked at, 
there's this deterministic requirement, and that's just not you know a, a, a low guarantee, low latency, but it's a determinism of delivery of, of of information and process of information. So that quality of service is utterly critical to many many use cases from industrial all the way up through uh, some of the more uh, uh, transportation related areas. So, so really, those are some of the relevant use cases. But again, they're they're common themes, uh, and and they all talk to the same things: business continuity, and and why fo open fog is is important is because you generally in some of these you'll have very specific vertical OEMs that don't have that openness, which then you know what we're trying to address: how do we make sure that everybody can can compete and and can can essentially drive new innovation in these markets. Let's well, not forget about security as an important uh, cross-cutting attribute there, too. All of these Absolutely. systems can be potentially hugely dangerous and have significant privacy implications if they're ever compromised. We think that the OpenFog reference architecture describes uh, a really rigorous security approach to uh, keeping all of these networks safe and trustworthy. Yeah, and I, one last thing on that, Chuck, you're absolutely right. Is this this is this goes to actually to a point recently where we hit, we've seen some of these attacks in this field uh, or, or deployed bases of IoT. But what usually happens in those is when people take and they build a technology, right? The SLC a vendor or a system vendor, they build a technology and they assume a certain deployment model. Oh, this is always going to be here. Don't worry about it. Or they hard code something. That won't work in our new connected world. It just will not work. And, and so with Open Fog, we really do, as Chuck pointed out, put an emphasis on security from all of the players uh, to that solution, from the system integrator and the software vendor all the way down to that silicon vendor. So, so um, you know, and, and we do have the security work group, which is working through these as, as well as all the different work groups and stuff. And I know that there will be many more use cases to come, and, and uh, you can find the details on, the, on these particular use cases in the reference architecture. There are also some other use cases that are posted on our website. Um, but let's, let's bring it home now. So, um, so we're, you know, again, there's lots of great work that was done for this document. Um, you know, are we done? Is this our mission complete? Uh, Rob, what, what's, what's next from your perspective? You know, the, your work is really never done in technology, uh, and that's really why it's so exciting, uh, I know, for, for Chuck and I and, and other folks in the consortium. But we, we've just done that first part to, to say this is what we mean from an open fog or a fog computing uh, perspective. This is the, the, the architecture, but we really need to drive to that next level, which is interoperability. That interoperability and, and uh, drives composability and some of these other things that are very, very important uh, to create interoperability. So we're not done. So our next task, and, and in the various work groups, we've really started focusing on these is, is building out those, the standardized interfaces and the, the shells and, and, and MUS. Uh, and, and that's really, really important. And it's really important for all of these different vertical markets and that we want to address. So again, we can have a, an open, open uh, innovative solution. So, so from us, in the consortium, I think that's our next job for the for 2017 and 2018. Uh, Chuck, anything to add there? I'm really excited about the test beds. The the possibilities of me building a fog node or yep. a piece of fog ready software, and having a, a way that I can get experts help me understand how it's likely to perform in the real world. I don't want to learn about that after I've just put 3,000 network uh, network fog nodes all over a city. I'd like to learn about that in a, in a test bed with one of my prototypes, and, and I think that the Open Fog Consortium's plan in that space is going to be really, really helpful to our industry. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up, Chuck. One of the things that I think is so cool about this is we don't think our architecture is static. In fact, we know it's not static. The only way you can move forward is to continue to refine. So we're engineers. We're, we're an engineering-driven uh, consortium with, with lots of academia and uh, academic support. But we want to use these test beds to not just prove the architecture, but maybe prove that we we don't have it right, that we can change that reference architecture. Again, continually continue to refine to really provide that end state of a truly open, interoperable architecture that's implemented for all of the different actors in that value chain. So yeah, I'm with Chuck. It's that test bed, it, it's the really that that's exciting and really we're just starting to kick that off. 
Lots of good things to come. So let's just kind of bring it home for everyone. We've covered a lot of material, but Chuck, do you want to just kind of summarize, you know, from your viewpoint, why why is the um, Open Fog Reference Architecture important to the industry? Well, the Open Fog Reference Architecture is, is really a high to medium level framework to help us understand how to build fog nodes and fog networks. It's really going to be useful for system architects, hardware developers, software developers, and the uh, business folk who support them in terms of creating the, the first generation of open fog networks, which is really going to end up being very essential to the future success of the scale of the IoT networks that we all envision. Uh, we, we think that the open fog reference architecture is going to unify the, the fog and, and, by extension, the edge ecosystem uh, under a single really interoperable uh, set of guidelines, test suites, and, and hardware and software standards will be derived based on the framework that the open fog reference architecture has provided. So why does it matter? Well, fog in general is a game changer. It, it's potentially as disruptive to the IT landscape and society at large as, as cloud computing or, or maybe even the internet. What we're basically doing is we're putting computation nodes basically right next to you wherever you are. And that's really, really important in order to make the IoT perform the way we all know it needs to perform. So the Open Fog Reference Architecture provides a, a unifying vision for us enabling us to figure out how computation, networking, storage, control, acceleration, those kinds of capabilities are going to be arranged on this continuum from the bottom of the cloud all the way down through layers and layers of fog nodes right to the top of the intelligent smart things that are out there. And uh, we don't really have a viable solution for that right now. The open fog architecture is really the first time where there's a glimmer of hope of, of cracking this nut, of trying to figure out how we're going to make the IoT live up to its promise. And, and we're not all the way there, but the 160-page reference architecture represents a giant step in the right direction. Great. Uh, Rob, any um, other things you want to add to this as we wind yeah. down? Yeah, one of the things that is also really important is is when you look at fog computing, it, it's not just a, a region A or geography B. It's it's really every region that we have worldwide has a different. And what I really like about what we're doing and what we're trying to do with this this reference architecture is the various country teams of the consortium they're taking this standard baseline that we have this this open fog reference architecture, and they're applying it to their very specific scenarios, their very specific use cases. And that type of, of commonality from start to apply it to a given scenario that's very important to their region, I think will really yield that 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 game changing moment for us in technology. So so to to myself and I know a lot of the others in the consortium, I, I think that's really the, the key aspect here is it, it's it's really a worldwide wide phenomenon and architectural effort. Uh, the other thing that you know I really like to hear is we have the right players, so the right mix of, of vendors. You know, ARM and Intel are in this consortium together, and, and I think that is key when we try to look at some of the, the fundamentals of, of security, how, how we can make things just better and more secure for our, our fully connected and immersive uh, lifestyles uh, worldwide. And so Open Fog Reference Architecture enables that as that first step to that end state uh, where we see it. So I'm, I'm really excited. It, it's just we're on that. The, the edge of awesomeness. So. The, the edge of awesomeness, I love that. So let's leave it and, and end it on that high note. And uh, wanted to thank both of you for um, all the great work on the reference architecture as well as taking time to record this. Uh, so thank you for those of you who are listening. And please uh, go and download and take a look at the reference architecture. You will find it at our website, which is, w, it, which is um, um, Open Fog Consortium. Dot org, um, and you can always uh, send us a note at info at uh, openfogconsortium.org, and we'll get back to you. So, again, thanks, everybody, and uh, have a good uh, morning, afternoon, and evening. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.